Dear colleagues, greetings from Ireland. Today I'm going to present for the session of complex cases from the Sagis Master Program, Facebook Collaborative, and my presentation will be about management of gallstone pancreatitis in pregnancy. I have nothing to disclose. To give you an idea about where I work, I work in Cork University Hospital, which is a tertiary care referral center. And under the red arrow, you can see the CU image, the maternity hospital, which is attached to the complex where we get quite few consults to look after pregnant ladies in these, this hospital. So last year, around August, I was called to review this 33 years old female, previously healthy. She's 18 weeks pregnant, and she was admitted with epigastric right upper quadrant pain, and her MLA's level was around 2,000, with mildly deranged liver function test in normal bilirubin. She had an ultrasound and MRCP, which confirmed multiple gold stones and CBD stones. Clinically, she was vitally stable, febrile, and that's her MRCB. She had a shrunken gold leather with multiple small stones in it, and quite few small stones as well in the common bile duct, as you can see in the second and the third images of the MRI. So. I posted that case on the Facebook group. What would you do out of those five suggestions? Would you do an ERCP followed by a lab call in the, in the same admission? Would you do an ERCP stint and defer the lab call until the lady delivers? Would you do only an ERCP without stint and then a lab call after delivery? Or would you opt for a lab call and lab proscopic CBD exploration? Or would you do nothing but treat conservatively, wait till after delivery, and then bring the patient back for active lab cooling? And this actually generated quite a few interesting discussions over the uh, Facebook page. Now, the first first comment was was about ERCB and laparoscopic cholecystectomy at the same admission, which was my initial plan. But other colleagues they suggested that. Just do an ERCB, wait for pregnancy to be delivered, and then do lab coli at least one month after delivery, which again created a few questions. Some other colleagues suggested lab coli and transistic CBD exploration. But from all the discussion, the consensus was that this lady needs her CBD to be cleared, so she needs an ERCB. The controversy was about the timing of the gallbladder surgery. So what I've done, first of all, I took the patient for an ERCB, so she underwent an ERCB sphincterotomy and CBD clearance, which was successful. Now in our hospital, we have a protocol for pregnant ladies that they, if they're going for an intervention, they will have a pre and post intervention fetal heart monitoring. So she had a pre-ERCB and a post-ERCB fetal heart monitoring, which was normal. After the ERCB, I went and I had a meeting with the patient. I counseled her about the lab coli, whether to, to be done this admission or whether to be deferred until she delivers. I explained all the risks, benefits, and details with her and her husband, and she decided to proceed with the surgery, so she was booked for surgery the next day after her ERCB, which is my usual practice. Now, in the morning of surgery, patient was called for from the next building, which is the CUMH. But again, as per protocol, she should have a fetal heartbeat checkup, which was done. To my surprise, I was called with this report that sadly there is no fetal heartbeat and it is a confirmed still birth. So 
what would you do in this scenario? I decided to cancel the surgery. I went, I had a meeting with the patient and her husband and gave our condolences to them. And there was a lot of psychological trauma involved as expected. So we agreed that we will postpone the surgery until things settled down and the joint team took over and she underwent a DNC and she was eventually discharged home. Eight weeks later, I brought the lady back for an elective lab query, which was uneventful. It was difficult, but was uneventful. And she was discharged home in a good, stable condition. And she was seen for follow-up in the clinic. And it was all unremarkable. So to discuss about acute pancreatitis during pregnancy, I did some literature review. And the following points were found now Acute pancreatitis during pregnancy is a rare entity in itself with an estimated incidence of about one case per 1,000 to 10,000 pregnancies. It's more frequent in multiparous patients. About 75% of pregnant ladies are multiparous. It's rare during the first and second trimester of pregnancy, around 12%, and usually occurs during the last third trimester, around 50%, or early postpartum period, which is 38% of the time. Historically, acute pancreatitis during pregnancy was a severe disease with a high maternal fetal mortality rate of 37% and 60% respectively, which I honestly find very high. But that's according to the old published series of cases. But the recent literature did show rare maternal and fetal mortalities of around 0 to 3 percent and thanks to early diagnosis and some maternal and neonatal intensive care improvement that brought those numbers down to around 3 percent. Now in terms of, of etiology, acute pancreatitis in general uh, and specifically in pregnant women, the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones, which stands for five to 100 percent of cases alcohol stands for five to ten percent idiopathic 15 percent triglyc uh, hypercholesterolemia in five percent and the rest of the causes are the rare causes which you see in in case reports only now because of the the fact that the pregnancy is a, a special condition so complications are important which include threatened preterm labor, prematurity, and in utero fetal death. Uh, there was a recent large retrospective study which looked at 300,000 deliveries, and it reported 101 cases of pancreatitis, 89 acute and 12 chronic over a 10 years period of time, which showed no maternal deaths and perinatal mortality was 3.6%. Study have noticed that patients who developed acute pancreatitis during the first trimester, they had the worst outcomes. So they have the lowest percentage of term pregnancy, around 60%, and the highest risk of fetal loss in 20% and preterm delivery in 16%. And they've noticed also that cases of acute biliary pancreatitis were associated with better outcomes when compared to cases of non-biliary pancreatitis. So treatment. In general, the treatment of acute pancreatitis in pregnancy follows the same principles for the general population. However, there is a particular entity about acute pancreatitis in pregnancy, and that is its high recurrence rate of around 70% versus 30% in the general population. A review article included 12 studies looked at 113 patients with confirmed gallstones, acute pancreatitis during pregnancy. And they compared conservative management with surgical management. And the outcome was that there was no maternal deaths in both groups. Maternal morbidity, fetal morbidity, and mortality were low and not significantly different between the 
two groups. However, in 12 reports about biliary pancreatitis, the author reported that there is a trend toward higher rate of fetal mortality in the conservative group, 8% versus 2.6% in the surgical group, suggesting the need for earlier intervention in terms of PRCB or cholecystectin. We, we, we all like guidelines, so I did look for guidelines regarding the management of acute pancreatitis in pregnancy, but I didn't find many. Uh, this is the most recent guidelines that were published in June 2019 by the World Society of Emergency Surgery. It's a very detailed uh, article and it's worth reading. However, there is nothing mentioned about acute pancreatitis in pregnancy in that paper. Now, the other guidelines that I found was the Japanese guidelines for the management of acute pancreatitis published in 2015. And again, it's a very detailed and very useful tool to look at with a very nice flowchart for the management of biliary pancreatitis to include ERCB, endoscopic spectrotomy, early lab coli versus late lab coli. However, again, there was nothing mentioned about pregnancy in this cohort of patients. So this, this is a SAGES meeting, so I looked into the uh, guidelines for the use of laparoscopy during pregnancy, which is a very valuable document published by SAGES in May 2017, and it consists of about 22 guidelines about the use of laparoscopy during pregnancy, and I will focus on the ones that is that are relevant to this presentation. So the first one is guideline six, which talks about cholangiography. And the authors recommend that intraoperative and endoscopic cholangiography exposes the mother and fetus to minimal radiation and may be used selectively during pregnancy. However, the lower abdomen should be shielded when performing cholangiography during pregnancy to decrease the radiation exposure to the fetus and the evidence is weak for this one. Now for cholecolithiasis, Sages recommends that during pregnancy, cholecolithiasis can be managed safely with preoperative ERCB with synchrotomy followed by laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now laparoscopic common bile duct exploration and postoperative ERCB are alternative to that, but comparative studies are lacking and the evidence is weak. However, the authors they did mention that when cholecolithiasis progresses to cholangitis, then the preterm labor and spontaneous abortion may occur in up to 10% of cases. So early ERCB is recommended in pregnant ladies with acute pancreatitis. Guideline 15 talks about gallbladder disease, and the author says that laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the treatment of choice in the pregnant patient with symptomatic gallstone disease regardless of trimester and the evidence is weak. However, the authors again mentioned that it is safe and it can be done whether it's the first, second, or the third trimester. Now, the timing of surgery again. Guideline 9 talks about laparoscopy can be safely performed during any trimester of pregnancy when operation is indicated and the strong, the evidence for this is strong. As, as we all know, traditionally, the recommendations for non-emergent procedures during pregnancy has been to avoid surgery during the first and the third trimesters to minimize risk of spontaneous abortion and preterm labor. But the recent research did, did show that it's safe to perform laparoscopic surgery regardless of the trimester, be it, be it a laparoscopic appendicectomy or laparoscopic appendicectomy. They also include fetal heart monitoring in the guideline 21, and they mentioned that fetal heart monitoring of a fetus considered viable should occur preoperatively and postoperatively in the setting of urgent abdominal surgery during pregnancy, but the evidence is weak, but it's always recommended to check before and after for 
medical legal as well as for the safety of the procedure. So, my dear colleagues, to conclude, acute pancreatitis in pregnancy is rare, but it remains a challenging clinical problem to manage. The most common etiology is gallstone disease. Ultrasound and MRCP are the preferred imaging modalities. Now, if cholidocholitiasis is confirmed, ERCB and endoscopy sphincterotomy is safe and effective with a shield to cover the uterus. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy during same admission should always be attempted. However, prenatal and maternal risks must be clearly discussed with the patient and the partner, and an informed consent should be obtained before any intervention. Again, thank you for having me, and greetings from Ireland, and I hope you are safe all over the world from the COVID-19. Thank you.